China, I guess, and a few other countries. So in 2050, it will not be so relevant. So that's why there are so many people interested in wind energy, as I noted from Monday up to now. So who are the big players, big players worldwide? In first place, as in almost everything else, that is China. They, they have 35% of the installed capacity in the world. Second place, I'm sorry this is in Portuguese, but China, you can understand this, United States, 17%, then Germany, Brazil is in the eighth place. Okay, uh, up to now only 2% of our electricity comes from wind power. So, in the whole world there are 539 gigawatts of wind power electric generation. So, just in order to show the evolution of the wind turbines, uh, since 1985 up to now, you, uh, this slide shows the diameter of the wind turbines, namely horizontal axis wind turbines. These are the, the uh, more common wind turbines and these are used in wind farms, okay? So nowadays we have turbines with a nominal power capacity of about 8 to 10 megawatt. And who knows what will happen in the future. But there are some, some difficulties in the future. So. I'll just show a sli uh, one slide by the end of my presentation, and then Professor Gao will go into the details about this. So, this is a already operating 7.5 7 megawatt wind turbine in Ercon for onshore wind farms. Here I have a uh, picture of the, as far as I'm, I know, the biggest wind turbine already in operation, but it's been tested up to now. I guess Dr. Tsen know if it is commercially available or, or not. I don't know if it is available. This is, it's entering the market. So, this is a Vestas wind turbine. Okay, th I took this from um, this blog, so you can find it. Just a few figures about it. Each, each blade weights 38 tons. The swept area about 21,000 square meters. Uh, it compares it with the London Eye wheel. And, okay. There is another type of wind turbine we, we, we say, okay, it has a vertical axis. What's going on here? Okay. So this kind of turbine, uh, they, they have two main different principles. Uh, in this one, uh, it rotates because the blades, they generate lift. They, they, ha they have airfoil sections, okay? And they can accept wind from any direction, so they are omnidirectional. And this is the, we call it Dahio. I don't know how to, to say this correctly, but I, 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 I say it as I read, Dahio. Dahio vertical axis wind turbine. And this one is a uh, more simple one. It's called Savonius. It's a drag. Uh, we call it drag because the forces that rotate the, the turbine, they, they drag the, the blades in the same direction. Okay? And here, uh, the, the lift, it, 
causes a moment, but it, this force uh, doesn't have the same direction of the wind, of the incoming wind. So this is drag turbine and this is lift turbine. Uh, these turbines, up to now, they are always smaller than the horizontal axis wind turbines uh, I mentioned before. So, uh, as I said, I have to make a miscellaneous presentation about some basic topics. So, let's talk about a little bit about uh, wind properties. So, if you go far above the ground, you, you, you find a strong wind, uh, it's almost a steady wind, we call it geostrophic wind. As you come close to the ground, the, the surface, it affects the speed of the wind. Uh, if you come very close to the, to the ground, you know that uh, the, the fluid, it has the same velocity as the surface, okay? So, assuming this is a very, very smooth surface, uh, the fluid that is in contact with the surface will have no relative velocity. To be zero relative velocity. But this is not a smooth surface. It, it has some roughness. Okay? So we, we adopt a, a model where we say up to a certain height, Z zero, the surface of the fluid is the same as the, the velocity of, the, of the, the fluid is the same as the velocity of the surface, okay, due to roughness effect. And due to shear, uh, the velocity of the, the, the air, the fluid, it starts from zero and it, it grows until it, it attains the value of the geostrophic wind which is far above from the surface, okay? So, in order to, to, to have an expression to, to show this profile, we, we make some hypotheses and we adopt this simple law, this power law. This power law, it relates the velocity at a certain height to the value of the velocity at another height. We, we know this value and we multiply by this height at which I want to calculate the velocity divided by the height of the known velocity, power to n. n, and this is a shear. Some people call it shear factor, shear coefficient, shear co exponent, uh, just shear. It's enough to identify it. And this, this z zero height, uh, we, we can extrapolate it. If you, if you measure velocity values along this profile, you can extrapolate the height up to which the velocity of the fluid is zero relative to the velocity of the, of the surface, okay? <coughs> so here I'm just a slide in order to, to show how shear affects the, the growth of the wind speed against the height. Uh, we have the velocity at 50 meters above the ground, a value of 8 meters per second. Then according to the shear, you have this different velocity profiles. So, up to 50 meters, uh, the less shear, the, 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 the faster the velocity grows. Above 50 meters, uh, last year the, the growth is more slow, okay? Just in order to, to show it to you how it works. This is according to this simplified power law. Okay. Uh, According to those hypotheses, we can make this, we can obtain this expression, the logarithmic profile for velocities. So here I relate the velocity at a certain height, 
I calculated starting from a known velocity at the reference height, z r. This is the that height above which velocity begins to grow. So we, we call it roughness length. It is related to the roughness of the ground. And you, you see, if you, if you measure the velocities at two different heights, you can calculate the shear or shear coefi coefficient. OK? So this is a simple procedure for you to, to describe the velocity profile, starting close to the ground and going to the geostrophic wind. So uh, it's clear for us that if the roughness is not so evident, the flow will not be very disturbed. But if you have this kind of roughness, uh, it will make a big mess in the wind profile, wind velocity profile. Okay, and you, you can study. I don't. I'm not going to talk about this. Different regions. You have uh, one boundary layer here, you have another one, a messy one here, and here you have another kind of boundary layer. Okay? The thing is, roughness uh, changes the pattern of the wind profile. So this is an uh, important influence. Just in order to put another example, we have a wind turbine here, yeah, and we have this different wind speed profiles, each one related to a uh, roughness length measured in meters. So you see, in calm seas and sand beaches, you have a very, very small roughness length, less than one, about one, one millimeter or even less. Okay? If you have grass, you have about one centimeter roughness length. In a forest, we have one meter. So uh, this is, as I said, an extrapolation. OK? It, it seems small. It's very small value, one meter, OK? Extrapolation. In, just in order to explain that wind speed profile I showed before. Uh, what we can see one thing interesting here. Uh, imagine this is a two-blade wind turbine. So you can see the blade that is pointing upwards, it faces wind with a, a bigger velocity than the blade that is pointing downwards, OK? So we have different loads here. The load, the aerodynamic load here is bigger than the aerodynamic load here. I think my light is going away. OK. I'll make it flashy. OK? Batteries. Oh, no, it's OK. It's not my fault. Okay. So uh, this is a source of a vibration because it, it makes the, the water shaft bend. Just an easy way to understand what happens to wind turbines. OK? Well, we, see, we saw that wind spin varies with height as a function of the ground, of the kind of surface you have. Uh, wind speed varies in time as well. So I, I think this, this graph is, shows some important information. This axis is related to the energy, it's a power spectrum. Okay? And this one shows uh, the period Imagine it is a, a wave, a sine and cosine, something like this, an harmonic function. Here is the, the period. So you have periods ranging from days to, to seconds. What do you see here? Ima imagine this, the velocity at a certain point of the atmosphere. I, it's goes through a complete cycle in four days. So it's almost a, a steady value of velocity. It varies very, very slowly. Okay? 
so it is influenced by large scale weather systems. So you can imagine this happens uh, far above the ground, the surface, and it's ruled by large scale, large scale weather phenomena. Okay. Now we have another peak of kinetic energy or of power with a period of about between 10 and 24 hours. This may be related to more local causes. For, ex for example, consider you have a you're measuring the wind speed close to the seashore. So you, there is wind flowing from the sea to the land and from the land to the sea. Why does it happen? Because land warms up faster than the sea. So during the day, the, the air close to the, to the ground, it hits, it goes up, and the wind flows from the sea to the land. Thank you, much better. So, during daytime, the wind flows from the sea to the land. So, at after evening, the, the land cools quickly and the water remains hot. So, the air flows up from the sea and the, the wind flows from the land to the sea during night. So there is a period, so the velocity changes during you know period. Time. And then we have another peak of energy. This is uh, much shorter periods of time, about one minute and all this. Well, uh, you see that the time scale for wind phenomena is different for other mechanical phenomena, time scales. Okay. I'm not going to the details. It's just a way to measure the, the energy of the wind. Okay. I don't. I didn't put the units here. Just a way to me measure the, the, me the energy of the of the of the wind wind flow of the. Okay. The more energy you have, the have more speed and more, more flow. Okay. And here I'm talking about the, from for periods smaller than ten minutes, we call it the, we call this kind of turbulence. So the frequencies here are, are very very low frequencies, compared to other mechanics equipments and phenomena, okay? Oh, there you go. I'm not lucky with this guy. Ah, okay. Just, this is just an example. Uh, it shows the, how the wind speed varies with time during a period of five minutes. Okay. So suppose you you you, you record the speed every every two seconds, something like this, and you have this graph. You, you calculate the average velocity, a and this is a, a measure of turbulence. How do you calculate turbulence? I think it only works when you hold it. Okay. Okay. 
how this works. Okay. So here we have different values of average wind speed. And for each value, we have a standard deviation. If we divide the standard deviation by the average velocity, we, we have the, a measure of turbulence. OK? So this is for a particular case, but a good example which shows that. For low wind speeds, you, you have a higher level of turbulence. In this range, the turbulence is smaller, and then you have, you have a skater here. Result. So we, we can, uh, it's, it's quite intuitive that uh, the higher you go, the less the turbulence, okay? So here we compare the turbulence. If you measure the velocity at a height of eight meters and compare it with the velocity measured at 24, 28 meters high. So you see, the roughness is higher here, eight meter above the, gro the ground and smaller here at 48 meters from the ground. Okay, so you, you try to put the, the turbines high, away from the ground, so you have less turbulence. Okay. Did I speak any? No. So, wind speed changes with topography. So if you have a gentle slope like this, you have an increase in the speed, wind speed profile. So this is a good place for you to, to put wind turbines. And this is a kind of ridge of a mountain. But if the topography is not so smooth, then you may have problems, depending on, on the place you, you put your wind turbine, because you have some turbulence around the surface, okay? There go. So let, let's look what happens when the wind meets the turbine. If you take a picture of the wind profile, it, it won't look, uh, it won't be a, a good guy. This would be the good guy. This would be the wind, wind speed profile that one we calculated using some simple expressions, uh, like exponential law, uh, power law. And you take a photo of the wind profile, and you'll find something like this. OK, this is a little bit exaggerated. But you see, the wind speed changes from point to point. OK? And this profile changes with time as well, as I have just showed you. So, if you, if you describe the, the, sp the wind speed looking at the wind from the inertial reference, okay, let's suppose the ground is an uh, th surface, is an inertial reference, you, you measure this with these values of wind speed, okay? But the blades, they face the wind with another component of speed, because it, it turns around this axis. So you have to add speed. So you have a relative speed. So the velocity faced by the blades has this kind of profile, which much more peaks and bailes. OK? If, if you consider this profile of wind speed to be frozen and you allow the, the water, the blades to rotate, the, this edge, you cut this profile and you to face a variation in wind speed values. Okay, it's easy to understand that. So all these speed variations, 
they make the turbine vibrate. That's good for me. Okay. So, I, I know I have seen this before. I guess Professor Paulo mentioned this kind of thing. So, to be a very, very brief comment. Uh, what is the wind turbine's job? So it, consider you have a cylinder of, of fluid, of air flowing here. Uh, we always have very low pressures. So you have a, you can think of this as a uncompressible flow, okay? Although we have air, we have, I, I guess. So th this, cylinder of air, this imaginary cylinder, it has a kinetic energy calculated by Dick's expression. This is the mass and the velocity to the square. Okay? So the wind turbine, it, it transfers mechanical energy from the wind, the kinetic energy from the wind to the rotor. The rotor begins to rotate. You have kinetic energy in the rotor. And this transfer happens at a certain certain rate. So we call it power. So power is calculated by this expression. What's important to note here, you have, it depends on the density of the fluid, about 1.2 kilos for cubic meter, the, the area, the swept area, and the velocity to the third power. So you, you must have big turbines and high velocities in order to have power. So it's important to understand that if you don't have flow, if you, if you don't have mass flowing through the disk, the, imagine the disk here, you don't have power. Okay? Or you, 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 you may have good wind, you may have a big area, but you, you don't take too much power, you don't produce too much power. So you have low efficiency. You also were presented to Bet's law. This law shows us that the maximum of amount of power you can produce is about 59% of the available power in the wind. Okay? So you, you cannot build a machine uh, okay, in, in this open air conditions, which takes more than 59% of the power available in the wind. Okay? Then suppose you have a, uh, a particular turbine and you, you know how much power you can take with it at a certain value of velocity. You divide this power by the available power in the wind, you have this power coefficient. Okay. I'm just making some definitions here. Ah, first time. So this is a power curve of a, of a turbine. Let's compare some things here. Uh, this is this graph shows you the, the power calculated according to Bet's limit. So at each value of wind speed, you calculate this expression. You have 0.59, this is the air density, the area of the, the disk, velocity to the third power divided by two, you have a 2.4 megawatt wind turbine. Okay. This is the, uh, the ideal case. Uh, this speed, we call it cut-in speed. At this speed, your turbine begins to work. It produces power. You can take energy from it. And this is the real power curve of the turbine. Uh, for many reasons, mainly safety reasons, you, you, you put a limit to the power. And you Okay, it's related to the generator you put in your turbine. So, 
you you start producing power here as the wind speed grows the power grows and up to a certain value of power okay this is nominal power of your turbine so you see you the power you produce is smaller significantly smaller than the ideal power you you could produce okay Uh, my name is Raquel, and I wanted to know this cut in speeds. Does it change like significantly according to the size of the turbine? Yes, if, if you have a, just think about the size of the generator you have to, to, to push to, to rotate, and you think about the inertia of the, of the rotor. For commercial turbines, it's, yes. it's about three to four meters per second. Three to four me meters per second. Yes, for commercial turbines. Okay, if you have some small turbines, sometimes you, you get something close to two, two and a half meters per second, but it's very difficult. Okay, thanks. You got the two. So here uh, I, I show you two graphs. Again, uh, uh, the power curve of, uh, of a turbine, now a three megawatt wind turbine. And uh, here I, I, I show the power coefficient curve against wind speed. So here is of something about between two and three. This is a very, very good wind turbine, I would say is cutting speed so here you divide the, the power you, you put divided by the ideal amount of power you could take emitted by batch law and as power increase you have the power coefficient increasing as well then you limit the power Produce. And since the wind speed is growing, your power coefficient decreases. Okay. So in, in case you have a turbine which operates in very, very high, very windy places, if you have high speeds, it's good for you to have nominal powers, uh, nominal value of power bigger. Otherwise, you, you lose efficiency lose power coefficient. So, another important concept. Uh, sorry for this, I, I took it for another. <laughs> there is a, this is an intuitive concept. There is an ideal rotation speed for your rotor. Suppose you have uh, the wind flowing towards the turbine. Just uh, consider a two-blade turbine, okay? So if the rotor rotates very slowly, you waste a lot of energy because the wind passes through this imaginary disk and, and does nothing. There is no energy transfer. The blades are here and the wind is passing here. So it passes unnoticed. So it passes unnoticed. Okay? Now imagine, well, the rotor is rotating fast. So it, it's this would be something like, uh, as I mo uh, shown before, the if, you, if you cut the flow, then you produce no power. This could happen here if it rotates, rotates very, very fast. So you're far above, above the ideal wind speed, uh, rotation speed. So when you rotate at ideal rotation speed, you, you have a high coefficient power, okay? Horizontal, double. 
Ok. 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 This is just another important concept for you. Because now, okay, one bad. Having bearing that in mind, we define this, this parameter, a tip speed ratio. You divide the, the speed at the tip of the blade. Okay, you multiply the rotor angular speed by the rotor radius, and you divide this speed value by the speed of the un un undisturbed wind velocity, okay? So you have this wind speed ratio. And, and it's a good idea to, to make plots of the power coefficient against this wind speed ratio. So you, you have an idea of the ideal rotation speed of your rotor. Oh, I, I put this this code here because I took this, this figure from this book uh, and this, this professor, he, in fact he was invited to give a lecture here but he couldn't, he's a very, very old man and so he preferred to stay at, at home. But he, in his book he, he says that Savonius rotor has a higher power coefficient than the traditional American multi-blade rotor. Use it in... You, you, you find this American multi-blade wind turbines in when you see Western movies. You see lots of these American multi-blade turbines. They use them for pumping. Okay? Uh, most, most books show this. They say this is the Savonius graph and this is American multi-rotor. So I, I guess American motor rotor say this is uh, American books say this is a graph for the American multi blade, and the other books say this maybe German or no, this is the graph for the American multi blade. Okay. So, but what can you see here that they attain their maximum power co coefficient uh, at low values of tip speed ratio okay so here you compare the two blade turbine a dahill dahill rotor that one with vertical axis and you come there's a graph showing the dutch forearms windmills you, you find many of these windmills in, in holland today Wind turbines vibrate. That's nice for me. Oh, just consider wind turbines. They are tall. Eh? They are slender. So they are very elegant. And they look like um, top models. Uh, and they point their nose upwards, just like top models. And they shake, they vibrate, oh, just like top models. So they look very elegant, but they're not. They're not proud. They're just. They are just pragmatic. Because, since they 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 vibrate, you consider the tower vibrates, the blades vibrate. So you don't want the blades to hit the tower. So you you have to find the ways to avoid this happening. So you point the nose of the nacelle, this thing is nacelle, upwards. So we have a tilt angle here. And you can shape your blades like an umbrella. They call it free band. And, and you can also put the root, not in this red plane, but you, you make a kind of pre-coning angle here. So you, you have a greater distance here, a tip clearance from the tip of the blade to the tower. All this because it shakes, it's elegant, but it shakes, and you don't want, don't want to destroy your turbine due to vibration, okay? This one, the next. 
So just a, a simple example of how we study vibrations of wind turbines. I did this with a seven degree of freedom, degrees of freedom model, very, very simple model. So let me show you the, the, the power, the tower band. So I, I put a degree of, mod, uh, degree of freedom here, the angle, angle theta. There is a degree of freedom for each plate. Theta, theta, B1, 2, and 3. You, you have torsion here, and so and, uh, two degrees of freedom here. And I, I studied the effect of uh, what we call a uh, kind of unit mass vibration absorber. A kind of big pend pendulum here. Just put the pendulum here. Not, not too crazy, this happens in real systems. I'll show you some photographs. And I also put some uh, uh, stiffness value and some damping value in this system. There's a seven degree of freedom. I wanted to study the effect of this pendular unit mass vibration absorber on the vibration levels here on the top of the tower. So this kind of uh, vibration absorber only works at a, a narrow branch of frequencies, okay? So I'll show you the results here, the results. Oh, one back, please. This one. So here we see the, the time, and here the displacement at the top of the tower. I'm sorry, it's important to be right. measured in meters. It's a small turbine, so the displacements are, are small as well. So uh, as the wind uh, acts on the turbine, there is a, a thrust force, okay? So due to this thrust for force, there is a static deflection of the nacelle as a whole, okay? It's pulled backwards. So this is a stat static value. And due to some excitations, uh, I, I considered uh, aerodynamic loads. I, I considered, in fact, aerodynamic loads and gravity loads and other kinds of loads, but uh, one of these loads, uh, it caused uh, resonance with the first natural frequency of my turbine. And I want to, to so I, I tuned the mass absorber in that frequency to see how it works. Okay, uh, let me go back to one slide. Physically, uh, this absorber, it, it applies a force on the same frequency of the vibration of the system. So the, the force tries to put the system back to its original static equilibrium position. That's how it physically works, okay? It must have a, a certain magnitude and the same frequency of the vibration of the device. That's how it works. And I compare here the vibration amplitude without the mass absorber and the vibration amplitude when I put on the vibration absorber. So it reduces the vibration amplitude to the half. So a good effect. But there, there is no, no free meal here. Uh, here we have to consider that this must be a heavy thing. So you have to consider a, a mass here. You consider the mass of the nacelle and the blades and a, a part of the tower and you divide it by 20 and you have to, to hang it here. So it's not a very good idea indeed. But some guys try it. I'll show you some photographs. Here you can see this big, big donut, biscuit, I don't know. It's a kind of pendulum. So you, here it's, they put it in a vertical by, uh, axis wind turbine. I show this because Professor Tsao is studies this kind of things. Maybe he can talk about this more for us. So you put this donut here, you 
you just don't only hang it, but you try to make it more effective. Okay. Okay. Just other examples here. This guy, he, he put the platform inside the, the tower. Uh, no. There is a gap between the platform and the, and the tower, and maybe he puts a, a spring and a damper here. But most times they put the donut outside the, the tower. Okay? So they hang it with these cables and, and put springs and, and damping devices around it. So as the tower shakes, this thing acts at, as a tuned vibration absorber. And now I, I mentioned in the beginning that there is a kind of a barrier in the size of wind turbines. So, just press it for me, please. Once. No, no. No. No, no. Advance, please. Stop it. Uh, no, no, no. Two, two slides back. This one. Yeah, uh, okay, I try to do it. Okay. Here we have the what could be a, a design for a 10 megawatt wind turbine. Why do I show you it? This is a, a solution for a 10 megawatt wind turbine. The, the guy put it on three legs and then a single tower, and he puts several generators up there. But what I want to point out here is, is this. In this design, uh, note that there are many, many elements related to vibration mitigation. Okay? Uh, and this is a part of the solution. If you want to make big wind turbines uh, above, above 10 megawatt power, you have to cope with severe vibration issues. Okay, though the solution passes through vibration mitigation devices. Now, I have to mention the main components of a wind turbine for those who are not used to it, just in order to, to see the parts of it. So here you have what we call the, the rotor. In fact, all the rotating parts are composed of rotor, but this is the rotor, they have the blades. Here you have the, hu the hub. The, the blades are connected to the hub. And they, modern turbines, they rotate around the longitudinal axis. Okay, so there is a blade pitch controller. It makes the blade rotate, rotate around its axis. So the hub is connected to a, a gearbox because it rotates at a very, very low speed. And you, you have to rotate the, the rotor of the generator. So I have to multiply this rotating speed here, rotation speed here, so you use a gearbox. Inside the gearbox you have, you have epicyclical or planetary gears, uh, and so you multiply the rotation speed. So you have the here you have to transmit very, very high torque because of the low speed. Here you have high speed, so you have small torque. You have some, some pumping systems here for oil and all this. This is called the bad plate. It must be a very, very stiff structure because you have to avoid bending of this shaft and because if this, sh this shaft transmit, transmits uh, high loads to the gearbox, it will fail in a short time. Okay, well this, this is the normally the weak point of the wind turbines. 
and the nacelle has to rotate in order to face the wind. So you have this yaw platform here. You have a, a, a big gear and it rotates around the vertical axis around the tower in order to face the wind as the wind direction changes in time. Okay? So this turbine is it has a gearbox. This other kind of turbine, we call it direct drive. There is no gearbox. So you have the rotor, uh, and the generator has the static um, part and the rotating part inside of it. So this is uh, heavier than the previous kind of nacelle because you have a very, very big generator here. But you don't have to multiply the rotating rotation speed, okay? This is called direct drive wind turbine. And this is a kind of bad plate. It, instead of being flat or something flat like the previous one, here you see this is a bad plate. In that case, it's, uh, this is Okay. I hope I wish you good luck then. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 put the last one, please. <laughs> the last, last, last slide, please. Okay. The last, please. The last one. Yeah. Thank you. So, this is uh, announced on concept, the, the, we call it pure torque concept. Okay, and then Siemens bought Alstom, and then they bought Gamesa, and they buy and everything. So you don't have a gearbox here. So this is heavier, but it's supposed to, to fail less. But I can tell you that this kind of turbine faces uh, severe vibration problems as well. So as I said before, there are no free lunch lunches in this in this area. Okay. Well, since I I, I, st I stressed the importance of vibration, uh, I just tell you that in the first slide I won't go back to it. Uh, I have two places, three places for for students, one for PhD and two for master. Uh, I already already have support for these students. But I'm interested in this kind of issues. Okay, now I'll put on my glasses and I present introduce you Professor Tsengao uh, with his long resume. Oh, please. Now change it to Professor Tsengao's presentation, please. So this is his short biography. I'll, I'll just read some points of it. So Professor Zengao, he is a professor at, of marine structures at the Department of Marine Technology at Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU. He graduated in China. He took his bachelor in, in China and did his PhD thesis in NTNU. He finished it in 2008, I guess, because you told me, I'm not reading it because it's not so easy for me. So his main research areas cover copper dynamic analysis of offshore renewable energy devices, uh, including offshore wind turbines of all kinds. He is participating in several research projects uh, funded by uh, related to offshore renewable energy. He has published, published only 152 technical papers. It's just the beginning of, the ca of his career. Oh. Nice. He's very young. Uh, he published om almost nothing up to now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he's a member of, of the Specialist Committee of Offshore Renewable Energy and a lot, a lot of many things. So I introduce you, Professor.
Nzengo. Thank you very much, Professor Nzengo. How are you? I give you the word. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here uh, to give a lecture about uh, offshore wind turbines. Basically, I will focus on design and uh, dynamic analysis of offshore wind turbines. And uh, my background is more related to marine technology. So, so, but I, as I, I understand that there are not so many students here who has the ba background on marine technology. So I will give some basic uh, introduction about uh, floating structures. And also, I want to mention DMGO because they uh, sponsor uh, my first five years of professorship at NTNU. So I'm still in this period. Uh, that is since uh, 2015. Uh, DMGO, if you don't know, it's basically an emer uh, merge of two cla uh, ship classification societies, DMV from Norway and GL from Germany. Okay, probably I need to stand here in order to to go forward. Yeah, and this is uh, basically the content of my talk, and uh, I will give a brief introduction, focus on offshore development of wind turbines, and uh, then I will mainly talk about design and the dynamic analysis, focus very much on integrated uh, dynamic analysis of wind turbines on the wind and the wave loads. And then I give some examples of bottom fixed jacket wind turbine and the floating wind turbine. Then uh, I'll also talk a little bit about uh, vertical acid wind turbine that has been not really developed uh, for onshore ap applications. But there might be some advantage of using it, uh, using it for offshore. And uh, then I will just highlight some of the research work uh, we have done or we are doing at ending. So you also notice the slides and numbers for different parts, and I will try to break, so take questions uh, for each part. And uh, you will also get the slide after the lecture. So the first part is just to talk about uh, what is a wind turbine and what is an offshore wind turbine based on different type of support structure, bottom face and floating. And then also give some of the industrial development of uh, offshore wind turbine, mainly in, in Europe. Some of the topic has been covered by Professor Demetrio, and uh, I will just quickly go through it. As I understand, I have like uh, 40 minutes for the first part, then we will have a half an hour break, and then I continue for another uh, uh, more or less two hours. Yes, before I start, I just also briefly mention other type of marine renewable energies that we are being developing or using. And the wind turbine, of course, uh, you understand that we attract wind kinetic energy and uh, basically to generate electricity. And we have also other type of resources in the ocean space, like tidal due to the current, tidal current and uh, ocean current. Or we can also use wave energy converter to convert uh, the kinetic energy in the wave propagation with different devices. And then there's also other types of uh, 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 conversions. But I want to highlight uh, that uh, except the wind turbine, which has to be more or less commercialized, or offshore is uh, on the way for fully commercialized, the other type of, to, uh, in a way, uh, uh, marine renewable technology has not to be so mature to be commercialized. And uh, basically they are uh, quite costly to develop uh, the technology to convert uh, different energy into electricity. I will briefly mention this uh, later on. So today we will mainly focus on offshore wind turbines. And uh, this of course uh, due to the development of onshore wind turbine, we have a very good basis for offshore development. And basically, we change the support structures for offshore application. You have put it uh, uh, into the water. 
And here I also show some different types of wind turbines with different support structure. Basically, you see the same type of turbines, but uh, support structure might uh, uh, vary. Basically, we have monopow jacket, spot, which is floating one, and same as submersible. And we could also have TLP type of floating wind turbine. I will discuss this uh, later on. Not working even here. Okay, I just briefly mentioned the wind energy that is available in the wind, and uh, this is connect energy, and uh, through a cross section area, normal to the uh, uh, wind direction, and with a given wind speed. So basically, it's a cubic term of the wind speed, and that is also important fact that uh, if we have large mean wind speed, and then we will get more available wind power. If I multiply with the time, you get the energy. And here also illustrates some of the potential of onshore and uh, offshore applications. There is a theoretical potential, but it's not really possible you to use all of these wind powers. And there's a variation of technical potential, for example, for offshore, range from 15 extra joule per year to 130. I just remember that the total electricity generation in the world in 2015 is about 87 HO. So basically, it's possible to cover all of the uh, uh, energy generation from offshore wind. But theoretically, it's not uh, uh, we will do this. We rely on other type of uh, sources to generate electricity. So this is better. And uh, another point I want to show is that uh, usually we have relative uh, stable and large wind speed in the offshore area. So here it's uh, just showing a map of wind speed map uh, in the area of Europe. And uh, this is Norway, this is UK, Ireland, and the main land of Europe. And this is North Sea, Norwegian Sea, and this is Mediterranean Sea. And you cannot really read the figures here, but uh, relative speaking, if we move to north, we have relative larger mean wind speed. Here, I give you some uh, examples. At the 100 meter height, we have annual mean wind speed about 92.5 meters per second at the North Sea area, where we found most of the wind turbine in, in Europe, offshore wind turbine in Europe. Yeah, then I can move. If this works, I can <laughs> just uh, stay here. It's better. Yes. So basically, for modern wind turbines we see today, they are quite uh, standardized uh, turbines. So you basically you see uh, three blades with horizontal axis, and uh, also you have upper wind. So wind blow to the turbine blade first, and then the tower. And also for more than large scale wind turbine, you have this possibility to change the rotation speed for low wind speed, so that you have the maximum power absorption. And then you have also possibility to pitch the blade to regulate the power for high wind speed. That we'll talk about later. So basically, a turbine is converted kinetic energy in wind and into the rotation, mechanical energy in the rotor. And then you have a generator connected, which basically transforms into electrical energy. So this conversion is, uh, is important. And uh, later, I will show you some of the efficiencies of these two conversions. And as Professor Demetrio mentioned, that, uh, that actually the heart of wind turbine is this part. This the, the nacelle, which contains a typical a gearbox, which converts the low uh, variation, uh, rotation speed. For example, for a 5 megawatt turbine, lo uh, lot operates like uh, 12 RPM, and then you have to connect to a generator, which rotates very fast, 1,050 uh, RPM. So you need to have a gearbox to convert this rotation. And if we look at the uh, uh, different uh, states of uh, operation of wind turbine, 
And uh, this is actually showing the uh, trust uh, thrust coefficient as a function of so-called in actual induction factor, uh, factor, which basically defined as a reduction of the wind speed at a rotor plane as uh, compared to the inflow velocity. So if we uh, look at uh, this stage and the wind turbine, wind blow in this direction through a wind turbine, then you would have a force which is along the wind direction acting on the, on the turbine. And the oppositely, you would have force acting on the wind which slow down the wind speed. And uh, so basically we have uh, expansion of the wake and the wind speed will be slowed down uh, uh, at the far wake. And then of course you also attract uh, the wind power. And uh, if you know also propeller for a boat, and uh, they actually oper operate in opposite direction. So the, the uh, vessel moves in this direction and the flow direction is this. And the thrust force actually acting oppositely to the flow direction, and which actually, from the, the uh, fluid point of view, accelerates the water. So you would have a contracted wake, and uh, which has a larger velocity. So this is uh, the thrust force is moving the vessel uh, uh, forward. So they operate in different uh, uh, regions. And of course, uh, uh, if you also look at uh, the, the wind turbine case for larger actual uh, uh, induction factor, and then they will have a wake effect. And most of the turbine actually operate in this region, where also the, ben, uh, later we'll talk about uh, the blade uh, elliot moment theory. So this is important to, to, to understand the, the, the physics between the force acting on the rotor and force on the fluid domain. And this has already been shown, and uh, theoretically we have a limit that uh, how much the wind power can be uh, uh, attracted or absorbed. So there's about 60% uh, highest. And uh, in principle, if you uh, try to absorb all of the wind power, then the wind, ha wind has to be stopped at a certain point, because the velocity has to be zero. And that is not uh, uh, practically uh, possible. So wind has to go through the wind turbine and with reduced wind speed, and then you attract uh, wind power. And the modern wind turbine has a very good uh, efficiency as uh, compared to this number. It's about 50%. Uh, and these are mainly referring to the, the aerodynamic efficiency. So the, that is related to the conversion of the wind kinetic energy to the rotor mechanical energy. But then you have also this uh, gearbox and uh, the generator. We have uh, another efficiency, of train efficiency, which is very high in, in theory. So you don't have a, a, a much loss due to this conversion. And the wind turbine control is also important because uh, uh, naturally we have varying wind speed from day to day, from time to time. So you do not have really very good uh, uh, constant wind speed that, could, that you can design uh, an ideal wind turbine for. So here I just plot uh, the different uh, power as function of the mean wind speed. And uh, it's not very clear, but uh, we are showing in cut in wind speed and rated wind speed, cut out wind speed here. And these are the available power in wind. And this black curve showing the typical uh, power curve for a modern wind turbine. And this for small wind speed, below rated uh, values. And uh, you operate the turbine so that uh, when the wind speed increase, you increase the rotation speed. So you achieve the maximum power uh, uh, coefficient, CP. While reach to the rated wind speed, you want to regulate power to have a constant power output which will be good for the grid connection. And then, of course, later I also, we will also see that uh, the loads will be reduced. So these are, uh, and also this is the rotation speed curve. So basically it looks like this. So it's important that uh, uh, wind turbine designed for different uh, operational wind speeds. 
Here also I show some of the wind turbine characteristics and in terms of power dimension. And uh, here also show the years that different, the maximum uh, uh, si uh, uh, power of wind turbine enter into the market. So you can see that, uh, say, 20, 30 years ago, it's only a few hundred kilowatts. But now it's about uh, 8 megawatt turbine that is already entered into market. So basically, you can say that uh, in all the days, uh, we can use uh, uh, one turbine of today to replace a whole wind farm. And uh, wind turbine blades, they are not very heavy. They are made of composite material. And uh, this is basically to reduce the gravity loads when it's rotated. But uh, they are pretty long. And for example, a 5 megawatt wind turbine, it's 60 meters of, of length, so diameter of 100 meter, uh, 120 meters. For 8 megawatt turbine, it's about uh, 82 meters. So there's a uh, Airbus uh, airplane, a three, uh, 380, which is a winged length of 40 meters. So wind span is about 80 meters. It's the same as the single wind blade for 8 megawatt turbine. And the weight is, I mentioned, it on uh, a few hundred, a uh, few like 15 and uh, 35 tons. And they have to put on very high uh, 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 to the hub height and basically uh, in order to, uh, 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 to, to, to have a certain, certain gap between the wind turbine tip to the free surface. And uh, I just uh, forgot to mention that uh, uh, when we look at the wind turbine, we all call, call it like five megawatt, five megawatt wind turbine. That we refer to the rated power of the turbine. So that is the maximum power you can get from a turbine. And uh, as I mentioned, the wind turbine have to work on four different wind speed. And then there's a so-called capacity factor, which is the ratio between the average power to the rated power. So because uh, the on land, you typically get uh, 25, 35%. So that means uh, about 30% of the time that uh, the turbine is uh, working on on, on, on the rated power. Offshore, we have more steady uh, state conditioning of the wind. You have relatively larger capacity fed. And to just uh, uh, give an example of 5 megawatt wind turbine with a capacity of fat of 40% can supply roughly 1,500 uh, 1, households in, in that order. And uh, I mentioned the material for blades. And if we look at uh, gearbox, uh, uh, nacelle, tower su support structure, they are basically steel structures. And uh, they are also uh, concrete structures that are used for support structures. Most of the wind turbine today use gearbox. Uh, as I mentioned, convert to low rotation speed of a rotor into high rotation speed of generator. And there's also development of direct drive or hydraulic systems for conversion. Okay. Yes, now I will start to talk about uh, offshore wind turbines and uh, start with bottom fixed uh, turbines. So, so the offshore development is uh, really rely on onshore and then we move slowly to offshore into shallow water and then to deep water. This is a very natural development. It's also a cost-related uh, uh, issues. But uh, here I show s already show some of the uh, foundations for sports structures. But most of them actually uh, looted from uh, oil and gas, offshore oil and gas industry. But in all the days of uh, offshore oil and gas development, they even use like a jacket, jacket foundation for about 400 meters water depth. But now these days, of course, we will probably use the floating uh, uh, sports structures. And uh, what depth is really playing a very important role to, to, to find the most uh, optimal support structure for developing uh, offshore wind turbines. But uh, of course, uh, on the gas platform, they are usually one of its kind. So, so you don't have many, uh, actually, 
produce at one time. But for a wind turbine, you develop uh, in, in the wind farm, usually consists uh, of 50 to 100 units. So there's a, a big advantage to use mass production or mass installation to, to reduce the cost of uh, energy. And uh, not only fabrication, but also installation is uh, very important. This is a particular issue for bottom phase wind turbines. And for example, for monopower wind turbine, this is just a single hollow uh, uh, steel cylinder, which has to be hammered into a seabed. Upon that, you install transition piece, tower, and blades. So all of this operation has to be done offshore and with support of installation vessel. In this case, it's a floating installation vessel, and in this case, that uh, is a jack-up installation vessel. So to, to use uh, standardized uh, wind turbine component and uh, to fa uh, accelerate the installation procedure is very important. For example, in, in, uh, these operations can only be carried out in red to uh, small sea states. So, you, so for example, in North Sea area, you can do this installation only during summer season, uh, uh, now. Uh, so you cannot really do this uh, in winter. So this is a big issue related to the cost uh, of the wind turbine development. And uh, if we move further offshore, and when the water depths getting uh, larger, so ideally, we will use uh, so-called floating structures. And basically, they are like a float, like a ship or platform with mooring lines, just to keep them in position. So a uh, different concept has been introduced. SPA, it's uh, just a cylindrical structure with a heavy ballast as a bottom to achieve the hydrostatic stability. And semi-submersible, you have multiple columns uh, to get the stalling due to the water pen area. Or you may have so-called a tension leg platform where you have larger buoyancy than the gravity of the system, so you have pre-tension in the mooring lines when you uh, uh, have the installation to, to achieve the uh, hydrostatic stability due to the tension in the tendons. So here I'm just showing some of the three dis basic disciplines to achieve hydrostatic uh, uh, stability and the corresponding mooring lines. And here I also show some of the examples. This is so-called the high wind concept, which is developed uh, uh, in Norway by Stator. And uh, this is a concept of, called the wind float, which is developed in the US by spring, uh, principal power. They have already, uh, Stator ha has uh, tested at the sea since uh, 2009 a 2.3 megawatt uh, uh, high wind uh, turbine, and uh, they just installed a small farm of five, six megawatt units in, in Scotland with the same uh, spa technology. And the wind float, they installed, uh, uh, tested the first prototype with a two megawatt uh, uh, Vestas turbine in Portugal, and uh, that is in 2011. And uh, last year, they, they commissioned uh, this project. So they bring back uh, uh, the, the floater to the shipyard and dismounted uh, all of the components. So fully finished the uh, small uh, lifetime cycle. The other concepts are just, uh, or uh, types of floating stretch are just uh, the concepts. And uh, they have not been uh, entered into any uh, uh, prototyping and testing phase. And uh, yes, and uh, we will have more uh, flexibility actually for floating wind turbines to choose different configurations and to explore different uh, possibilities as compared to on land wind turbines. So there's a variety to use horizontal acid wind turbine or vertical acid wind turbine. Later I will discuss more on this. Or uh, we may use, say, three or two blades and uh, or upwind and downwind turbines. And uh, I also want to mention some of these, uh, actually there are three turbines that is under testing in Japan, uh, two, uh, two megawatt turbines and one seven megawatt wind turbines. So Japan is also developing 
voting went up uh, 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 significantly in recent years. And also, I mentioned some of the area like in US, Mediterranean Sea, Japan, uh, or northern part of North Sea, Korea. There's a good site for uh, voting wind turbine. It's basically because the water depth is large. So, so it's not really economically uh, viable to use bottom fixed turbines because you have to have a very large support structure, which was, it will be very expensive. Here is uh, some of the industrial development of different types of foundations and uh, bottom fixed and floating ones. And as I mentioned, uh, what depths plays a very important role to, to find the most uh, suitable uh, foundation for, for different uh, uh, what depths. So it's, uh, and uh, it's not really very clear at which what depths that floating wheel turbine will become more competitive as compared to the bottom fixed one. At the moment, of course, you have uh, extra uh, uh, materials in the floaters and uh, extra material in the marine system of cables, which give the uh, uh, which makes the floating wind turbine relatively expensive. Expensive, but probably in the order of 100 meters, that uh, floating wind turbine will become more com uh, cost competitive. There's also a very important software development since 2005, which is actually initiated by International Energy Agency. NREL in the US has been playing a big role in this uh, uh, benchmark study. And uh, they started with code to code comparison, and actually now it's ended into the code to model test and code to field measurement comparison. So it's uh, very important that uh, this is ongoing and, uh, and uh, bring a more reliable software for design and uh, analysis of wind turbines. Meanwhile, there's also international standards that is on the development. They looted from the, the bottom face, uh, uh, design laws for bottom face uh, offshore, oh sorry, for on land wind turbines and then move to a bottom face offshore and then floating wind turbines. What time is it now? Well, that's good. Here I'll show some of the uh, trends in offshore wind development. And the, the important trend is that uh, there in recent there's a big cost reduction uh, uh, in offshore wind turbine development. It's basically due to the fact that we are using larger scale turbines and the and designing more optimal support structures and also reducing the installation, operation, and uh, maintenance cost. Up until now, it's about uh, 15, 16 gigawatts uh, offshore uh, installed in Europe. So it's not a big amount as compared to the total uh, uh, on land uh, or total installed wind capacity, which is about 500 gigawatts by now. So, but it will increase, and uh, basically it's about, uh, annual increase is about uh, 30%. So every three uh, year you have uh, double the, the installed capacity. And here is showing, it's not very clear, but it's showing different uh, size of turbines that is in the market or uh, uh, in the farm that is installed in different years. Here is showing the, uh, megawatt turbine, which is smaller than three megawatts, is the majority. That is uh, from 2001 to 2005, and uh, then we have increased turbine three to four mega five megawatts for the next five years, and then the next five years increasing more. And uh, in the future, there are more orders like using five to se eight megawatts, even about eight megawatt turbine. So there's an increasing uh, uh, use of large size turbines. And basically, you will reduce the, the cost uh, of installation and maintenance per megawatt if you, have, if you use large turbine. And uh, also, I think a floating wind turbine will also be developed and uh, will play a rather important role. And there are not so many uh, at the moment. 
uh, totally maybe about uh, 40 megawatts in total. And uh, here it's not very clear, but it's showing some of the places that is uh, developing floating wind turbines. And uh, naturally, uh, uh, the developers, they, they first test prototypes or a single unit, and then develop into a small farm, a few units, like five units, and then go for the with large uh, commercial size farm, typically 50 to 100 units. So this is a very natural development. And uh, I believe that uh, in Brazil, you have relatively large water depths, 1,000 meters. So it might be very difficult to, to, ha to use uh, uh, cost compared to uh, wind turbines. But of course, uh, eventually, if you use, probably you will use floating wind turbines. And here I'm showing some of the levelized cost of energy or cost of electricity. And just try to compare uh, uh, different uh, renewable energy uh, uh, electricity generation. I don't show the, all of the details here. This is from 2015. And the units here is euro per euro cent per kilowatt hour. I'm showing the basic average of the onshore wind turbine and offshore wind turbine and compared to the relative small size hydropower. And uh, here it's uh, showing like uh, about, uh, well, I, I even cannot really read, about 60 uh, euro cents per kilowatt hour for onshore, which is comparable to, to small hydropower. And uh, offshore is more or less twice as expensive as onshore at the moment. And here is some prediction uh, towards 2030, and also they're showing some of the uh, 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 cost estimates during the bidding press uh, uh, for some of the offshore wind farm in, in Europe. Here is a different unit, uh, euro per megawatt hour. So uh, we are expecting that uh, this blue showing the overall decreasing of the uh, uh, levelized cost of energy towards uh, like 60 euro per megawatt towards 2030. And this will be then same as the online uh, uh, wind term price we have today. So this is very important and uh, this is also mainly due to the use of large size wind turbines. And uh, it's a very good trend that uh, 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 it's decreasing and towards a more uh, uh, commercialized turbine. And I so also want to mention that in some of these farms, actually, uh, during the uh, last two years, during bidding process, and uh, they asked for zero subsidies from the government. So, so that means in the future they will uh, really uh, commercially operate uh, uh, their wind farms. And in the beginning of development of offshore wind turbine, you actually see an increase in the uh, uh, cost of energy. but. Uh, due to the mass production and uh, better uh, 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 installation, maintenance, and so on, then it's reduced. Here I also show some of the cost components. And uh, for on -land, onshore wind turbine and for offshore bottom phase wind turbine, we don't have commercial floating wind turbine uh, yet. And you can see that uh, support structure will play an important role. Basically, you have uh, needed to have a larger support structure of offshore development. And, uh, and uh, also, operation cost will be relatively high uh, as compared to online, because it's not easy to reach uh, uh, offshore wind farm, especially in bad weather. And, uh, you, uh, and typically, it will be 20-30% of capex, uh, capital expenditure. Uh, for the lifetime cost. And by the way, uh, offshore wind turbines, they are usually designed for 25 years uh, of lifetime. And uh, of course, uh, in the future, uh, most of the wind term, uh, offshore wind turbines have not reached the, the, the lifetime yet because they developed recently. But the, the, the first wind turbine uh, offshore wind uh, farm, which is uh, in, in Denmark, and they just uh, decommissioned the last year. It's from 1991. But the individual unit is about uh, a few uh, hundred kilowatts. 
so they are relatively small as compared to today's wind turbines. And uh, later on, there will be naturally a problem whether we can extend the lifetime of wind turbines by uh, its actual use of the, of the fit, uh, uh, structure and so on. So basically, we rely on increasing wind turbine size, improve manufacturing uh, from, uh, uh, in infrastructure that is also related to grid uh, to reduce cost of energy. Yes, I just uh, stop uh, here, and uh, I will be glad to take uh, any questions. And probably I will also, we will also have a um, break uh, now after the questions. Any questions? Yes. Good morning, Professor. My name is Ulysses from Brazil. Uh, the last slide, you show us that the cost of uh, offshore turbine in is, uh, uh, is less than the offshore is less than onshore. But uh, when, when we construct the the equipment we already uh, prepared to indice protector, and uh, uh, I, I imagine that the cost of offshore because the the sea uh, is is higher than than the yeah the uh, onshore. Why? I, I probably don't, I I'm don't not understand. very clear about here. This is a percentage of the cost to its own, like uh, if it's onshore wind turbine, what is the percentage of cost for different parts? And uh, if it's offshore wind turbine, what is the percentage of different parts? And as I mentioned that uh, the actual absolute cost uh, of energy for offshore is about twice of onshore. So, so the absolute value for the uh, offshore is much costly, but the components it's also, there's also a big part of suburb structure that is costly for offshore. It, it's natural that you have to put a larger suburb structure in the water, yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Professor, thanks for your presentation. So good. Um, I would like to compare, um, can you explain roughly uh, if we, we have uh, 5 megawatts, for instance, uh, if you compare a vertical axis and horizontal axis, which is better? Uh, well, uh, I will particularly mention vertical axis wind turbine in my later presentation, so you will get an idea about uh, this comparison. We also have uh, done some comparison for floating vertical axis wind turbine and uh, horizontal acid wind turbine. And then you also see the, the result. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yes. <laughs> I will have uh, many uh, breaks. I, I, I <laughs> Later, you can ask. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I also have curiosity. Uh, see, you, uh, Professor, um, the last slide of um, not your last slide, but the, the former presentation uh, from they, they, they talk about direct drive uh, wind turbine, which should be more reliable, and at least it was, I understand. And I, I do not know if you will approach it, uh, this, this kind of comparison, direct drive wind turbine with a gearbox, uh, if there is any kind of efficiency gain, because when you have a direct drive, you know that you could uh, generate electricity in whatever, of course, inside the range, but whatever uh, broader speed, uh, because you can treat the energy as you like. And with gearbox, you don't. You have to, if you are connected to the grid, you have to, uh, to stay in their frequency. 
So which will be the gains and the losses of this kind of technology? Because I'm studying not wind turbines, but I'm studying with turbines with direct driver uh, generators or gearbox generators. Yes, I'm not an expert on this job chain and uh, uh, issues, but most of the turbine used today rely on gearbox. And, uh, and uh, the problem with that is that you have mechanic components of gears, and then you may have damage there. And also there will be uh, lubrication issues. So there's always maintenance issues. And you have to also design the gearbox so that you uh, uh, have the load capacity for 25 years and so on. So I'm not very sure about the, the direct drive, but you will have less mechanical components. It's mainly electrical and electrical. And then it's, uh, but uh, what I understand is that uh, usually for the same megawatt and uh, you have large weight of direct drive, and uh, which is not really beneficial for a floating wind turbine because then you would, uh, when it's smooth, will induce larger uh, uh, loads in the tower and so on. So that uh, is also one concern. But I don't know <laughs> the future development. There's a lot of uh, uh, companies now pursuing the direct drive. Yeah. Maybe you can comment. 